Hey, Leroy, how you doing? Hey, Leroy. Hey, Laurie, how you doing this evening? All righty. All right, all right. Good, right? All right. You got it. Got it. Well, welcome everybody to CB11 Transportation Committee meeting. Thank you to our board members coming out again to another committee meeting. Um, and thank you to DOT for being here tonight. So I'm going to hand it right over to you for your presentation. All right. Um, so Stevie, I'm going to go first uh, because I have a, uh, an update in terms of the 17th Avenue pedestrian bridge. Uh, I'm not sure when the last time you had an update, so I'm just going to go over what has taken place and what we're looking at in the future. So in November of 2021, uh, we established a staging area um, located on either side of the Bell Parkway. Uh, the staging area is where the materials and equipment is stored adjacent to what becomes an active construction site. Um, as you, as we all had this conversation before, Monty, we know that the bridge was uh, shut down uh, and that work wasn't being done at the time, mm -hmm. but it was shut down prematurely, uh, and we know that that happened. In the spring of 2022, uh, we installed the uh, protective shielding uh, under the bridge. Uh, the shield is necessary to protect the vehicles from the construction debris. As a result, double lane closures on the Bell Parkway were necessary. And anytime we close anything on the Bell Parkway, we also uh, was able to um, have some temporary locations for the cars to go to. Um, uh, and that we spoke about that on several mm -hmm. occasions. I think we even changed something. We also got the police involved in terms of, of, of enforcement and helping with the traffic patterns. Uh, for the for for that, uh, right. in April of 2022, we did the lead paint abatement, uh, which is the re uh, removal of hand tools of multiple locations across the span of the bridge, and uh, they were able to do that. And that took about a couple of weeks for that lead paint abatement to happen. Um, November, October, November, we did the support beams installation. We set up the center support beam to aid in the removal of the bridge. Um, and um, let's see, the, the traffic was cut off during the evening hours to make that happen. And then in November of 2022, we removed the bridge uh, and uh, we had alternate routes set up again uh, for, for, for that bridge removal because we did have to close some of the lanes on, on the Bell Parkway. Uh, and in January, we began the pile driving. And that was the um, the casing that supports the foundation of the structure. And all that driving was done by uh, a, a tool that was attached to a construction vehicle. Um, but depending on how it went, uh, I think it went very well. Um, they, I believe, are finished with the pile driving. So right now, um, the next step will be to fill the piles with concrete to form the foundation. Uh, the bridge foundation or the footing will be constructed by installing rebar, which is a metal rod that is used to reinforce the concrete. Uh, that process should take about one to two months. And once the foundation is complete, the process with rebar and concrete placement will be done as a second level that will give the new bridges required height of clearance over the parkway. Um, so as you know, we've had a little bit of difficulty with this particular contractor. Um, we have um, encountered significant delays. And uh, what we have asked the contractor to do is to bring in a new management team uh, that is now in place. And that team has been directed to prepare for a recovery schedule, which will tell us if we can make up any of the lost time. We found that this contractor just wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They did some things that they weren't supposed to do. And so we had to give them a stop work order and sit them down, explain to them what we found that uh, they were not doing correctly. And we asked them to bring in a whole new management team. 
And unfortunately, that's where we are at this present moment. We're waiting for that new management team to get on board and to them to begin the work again. That's why you haven't seen work being happening there uh, right now is because we, we told them they had to stop because they weren't doing what we asked them to do. Uh, they weren't uh, following the, the regs. They weren't following what they even told us they were going to do in the contract. So right now we're working with them to get the new management team on board as we can move forward. Unfortunately, what that does is that extends the projected completion date to the spring of 2024. Yes. And that's where we are right now. Lori, you're muted. I saw that yeah. loud, but you were muted, Lori. <laughs> I, I saw it too. I saw yeah. it too. Yeah, only because this project, oh my yes. gosh, we started meeting on this project, I mean, like years ago. Yes. Years. Yeah. And like it's 2024, so it's another summer without. Yes. Unfortunately, um, this contractor has not lived up to our expectations, has not done what they were supposed to do. So we're trying to work with them in getting this rectified by bringing a new management team and seeing if that new management team could uh, give us you know, some time back. Maybe they can get it done sooner, but as of right now, the anticipated completion date is the spring of 2024. Lori? Yeah, Moni. Yeah, I... I... I know in other contracts, when similar incidents have happened like this, contracts have been rescinded. At what point do you bring in um, a contractor that can complete this job and, and in a timely manner? Well, I think at this point, since we're, we stepped in because of what was been happening, we feel that by working with them and bringing in a new management team that they, they will be able to complete the job. Okay. As we see it, you know, as which was stipulated in the contract. And and while I still have the floor, mm -hmm. um, so we're not receiving updates on the stages and and on um, where this job um, currently stands. I mean, is there any way for you to bring that back to the commissioner? And in yes. some way, in other, we're not asking for a weekly. I mean, we've had right. community liaisons that were very active and, and sent us um, updates on a weekly, but at least a monthly for okay. a look ahead. This is what we're up to. And this way we can share that information. Yes. But and, and I don't think that's an outrageous request, Marnie. And I will no. definitely bring that back and ask uh, Bridges if they can do that on a regular basis. Thank you. We'd, we'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, I would say the, the updates really won't start until we get the new, uh, the new um, management team in place. Once we get the new management team in place, we will have a better idea of how we're going to be moving forward. So then we can give you those regular updates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been two years, a little over two years. Right. And I have to pull teeth to get that or call mm -hmm. you. And while you've been helpful, you right. have someone in place that should be giving the board those updates. Understandable. And I, I would definitely take that back without a doubt. Thank you. I can second that. We haven't been getting updates either at all. Okay. No problem. I definitely will follow through with you, Moni, on that. Thank you. Thank any you, other, Leroy. Is there any other questions? Anybody from the committee have a question about the pedestrian bridge? No. All right. And oh, I did want to tell you that we are working with TVTA because you know they're going to start their their project. Um, I don't know too much about it off the top of my head, but I do know they're going to be starting their project uh, widening the, or coming off the uh, Verrazano. They don't have In a project. 10. Yes. Yeah. So, but I think that will probably start. They will probably start that prior to this completion. So we are, I just wanted to let you know we are in conversations because I know sometimes um, 
when we when we do projects, we're not in conversations with some of the other projects that are happening around. But this time we are. We're, we're keeping it up uh, up to date on all the the projects that are, are engaged and all the different agencies and us work. We're all working together when it comes to that. So I just wanted to to let you know that, Marty. Thank you. And will that have any impact on on the work at Seventeenth Avenue? No, I didn't think so. No. Just traffic. Yes. Moni, is the sign up about people who are walking that they could go to Bay Parkway to get over to the uh, shore? We requested that. Um, I would have to double check in the morning. And if it's um, not, Moni, definitely send me an email. You got it. Definitely send me an email. I, 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 I just have to find email. out where they would have put it. Right. And uh, I will get them working on that right away. Yeah, it it was up as I recall, Lori, down by Shorehaven, so that people didn't walk up that way to go over. That lived in between the park and Shorehaven. Um, right, but it well, would be good to put it on Seventeenth Avenue in Shore. Correct. I just need to double check. Right. We may just have to add another sign. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Leroy. You're welcome. Okay, and so, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Stevie. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everyone see this? Uh, so I'll just introduce myself again. I am Stevie Five. I'm with the Department of Transportation and I am the project manager for our car share permanent program. Um, so I'm just gonna go over what car share is, um, a few statistics and some data from our pilot program that we ran in 2018 through 2020. Um, then I'm gonna introduce Tori from Zipcar, who's gonna explain a little bit about Zipcar, how their program operates um, and the sites that they selected and why they selected them. Um, so CarShare provides on-demand short-term access uh, to a shared fleet of vehicles, typically through a membership, and you can rent the car by the hour or for the full day. DOT launched um, a CarShare parking pilot program in June 2018. It was uh, mandated by the city council. So Zipcar and Enterprise were our partners in this pilot. The pilot comprised 230 on-street spaces and 55 municipal parking facility spaces. In Brooklyn, there were, during the pilot, there were 108 spaces in seven different neighborhoods and 20 off-street spaces in seven different lots. The two-year pilot averaged 24 trips per space per month, uh, serving an average of 17 different households per available vehicle. For Brooklyn specifically during the pilot, it averaged 21 trips per space per month, serving an average of 16 different households. So during the pilot, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and vehicles mild travel declined 7% and 6% respectively. We partnered with University of California, University of Berkeley at California. Uh, they created customer detailed customer surveys, three of them, one for before the pilot during the pilot and after the pilot for car share members. And through these customer surveys, we concluded that for every one car share vehicle on the road, four personal vehicles were either not purchased or were sold. And for your community board, we have four selected sites. Each site is two parking spaces. These sites are located on the same block base at the corner, like the picture below. And each site will have a regulatory sign saying car share parking only, that it's dedicated for the car share car. And with that, I will turn it over to Tori from Zipcar. If he is able. Tori, are you on? Uh, give me, I'm so sorry, give me one second to see where.
She's a, as a, okay. Can you guys see and hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hopefully. Okay, yes. Great. How are you doing? I'm Tori from Zipcar. Thank you, Stevie, for that introduction. Uh, I'm manage public partnerships and policy for Zipcar. I'm based in New York. I'm actually based in Brooklyn, uh, a little bit further north than you guys. But uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, to meet with me tonight and to hear a little bit more about Zipcar and the On Street program and our uh, prospective operations in your community board. Uh, Zipcar has been operating in New York City for over 20 years. We have over 2,500 vehicles, 60 different makes and models in our New York City fleet at over 600 different locations, 190,000 members in New York City, tens of thousands of those are here in Brooklyn. Uh, and we really um, are focused on enabling simple, sustainable, and responsible urban living. In Brooklyn, the average Zipcar reservation is generally between 8 to 10 hours and 60 to 80 miles traveled. So that tells us is that people are using zip cars for uh, for purpose driven trips. You know, they're not using it uh, for a shorter trip that they might walk or bike or take public transit or even an Uber or Lyft. You know, they're going to visit friends and family. They're running important errands. Uh, they're going out of town. They're probably leaving Brooklyn. They're probably leaving the city altogether. And um, that's just a reflection of our use cases and how car sharing generally works. 85% of our members do not own a car. 25% uh, of them got rid of their car after joining. Many members uh, drive fewer members, fewer miles than they did before joining Zipcar. And overall, all of this helps us reduce traffic congestion and helps us reduce the number of personally owned vehicles on New York City streets. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zipcar, uh, you join as a member. You can do that from your desktop computer or from your phone, and you can instantly access a car. You can rent the car for an hour. You can rent it for a day. The cars are available 24 hours a day. Uh, and we generally find nationally that our members save upwards of $784 a month compared to car ownership. And that's nationally. So in New York, where we know everything is more expensive, especially in Brooklyn, uh, we can only imagine that number is much higher. Uh, every reservation includes gas as part of your um, hourly rental fee. And it includes a round trip parking spot. So when you come home, you don't have to worry about finding parking. You park it exactly where you took it. Uh, insurance, maintenance, roadside assistance in the extremely unlikely event that you need it. And uh, you can travel up to 180 miles per day included in your normal fee. Uh, so, I mean, our use case is really that we enable all New Yorkers to have access to a car without owning one. Um, you know, a lot of New Yorkers come from car-free or car-light households, and this gives them the access to the same opportunities as everyone else. I've been a Zipcar user far longer than I've been a Zipcar employee. And I found that as someone who doesn't own a car, that it's a great option to do a lot of the things that people who own cars might otherwise be able to do easily. And uh, by working with DOT, we're looking forward to expanding that benefit to every corner of New York uh, in areas where we found that our members live, but there's unfortunately um, a lot of unmet demand. And by, by using CarShare, by using Zipcar, um, our members tend to make a positive impact on the environment. There are fewer emissions, less driving, more carpooling, and more space. We have a uh, Research that shows that for every car share vehicle put on a city street, up to 13 personally owned vehicles are taken off city streets over time, returning that space to the community, uh, reducing competition at the curb for parking or whatever else, and um, you know helping just improve quality of life for all New Yorkers. So in um, in your community board, uh, we've identified four locations that make sense for the expansion of car share, uh, as pictured here. Uh, we've as I mentioned or touched on a moment ago, uh, we track demand, but we track unmet demand. Every time somebody opens an app uh, or looks for car share vehicle, but more importantly, when they look for a vehicle and they're unable to book it, um, that unmet demand is tracked as a data point. And over time, you know, we have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of these data points that allows us to see where there's high levels of unmet demand across uh, various neighborhoods. And so when we're partnering with DOT to put cars on street, um, our primary metric here is not only unmet demand, but uh, selecting locations that allow us to provide access to areas that are otherwise unable to serve. We're also looking for areas that are adjacent to existing transportation infrastructure, whether it's a um, subway stop or a bus stop, bike lane, uh, bike share, uh, pedestrian thoroughfares, all of that thing. And that's a reflection of um, that most of our members tend to live multimodal lifestyles. They tend to walk more, they tend to bike more, and we're trying to meet them where they are. Um, yeah, so these are our locations. We can go to the next slide. 
As part of our expansion with DOT, we have an equity and outreach plan that's focused on equitable and affordable access. That includes uh, continuing and expanding our NYCHA partnership, which uh, provides all NYCHA residents uh, free membership and driving credits and discounted rates on cars at NYCHA locations. We also work with NYCHA to provide marketing materials in four different languages to make sure that you know all residents are aware of the amenity or enabled to access it if they would like to. As part of this expansion, we'll be launching a SNAP program, which will give discounted memberships to all qualified SNAP recipients across New York City. Uh, that's 1.7 million New Yorkers and over a million households. So we're really excited about helping to bring uh, this benefit to low-income households across the city that, that need it. I will also be looking for local community partnerships and um, working with local communities to provide support and outreach to promote awareness. Uh, to that end, if uh, the CB has any ideas for local organizations that we can partner with, you know, whether it's something over the summer, like sponsoring a summer streets, I'd love to connect with you after this call. So please feel free to reach out to me. But, uh, you know, we're really invested in making sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're partnering with every community that we're serving and that, um, you know, that we're working hand in glove with everyone to make sure that uh, this is welcomed in the communities that we're uh, operating in. So I think that's all I have here, um, but if you guys have questions, I'd love to answer them uh, to the extent that I'm able to. And thank you for your time. Okay. Um, we'll go in order here. Angelo? Hey, good evening. So I've got a couple of questions. Maybe you can clarify them for me. Um, is there any plan to convert these vehicles to electric vehicles as opposed to combustion engines? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Answer I, one I, at a time, or do you want me to... I've got two more questions. You can answer okay. them one at a time as well. The answer is yes. We're working on fully electrifying our fleet. Um, our fleet should be fully electrified by 2030, but right now we're 2023. So right now we're working on bringing in EVs and hybrid vehicles. Uh, right now, the on-street program, you know, there's not chargers on street. So, you know, we're working with DOT, you know, as recently as a few days ago to uh, to figure out what that looks like and how we can make that happen. But our um, our existing fleet is uh, greener and gets better MPG than the U.S. average. But um, in any case, we are uh, working to bring in um, EVs and hybrids into New York City. I believe on May 1st, we have like somewhere like um, in excess of 300 EVs coming into our New York City fleet. So we're really excited to work those in uh, to provide a sustainable alternative to, to regular cars. Okay. Um yeah, so the other question they have regarding maintenance of the vehicles. I mean, what happens if a vehicle breaks down? Who's responsible for maintaining it? And, you know, do, where where are the vehicles maintained and who maintains them? So we work with a, a fleet of maintenance providers. They visit all of the cars uh, several times a week to check on them, to clean them, to make sure everything is good. They also clean uh, the curbside where the vehicle is parked or that everything um, is uh clean and tidy. If there's like a blizzard, you know, we would shovel the spaces. But uh, if in the unlikely event you have a maintenance issue while you're renting the car, you would call our customer service. That would be a zip car responsibility and we would take care of you. But, uh, you know, we do our best to maintain the fleet uh, to the best of our ability and to try to avoid those types of issues. We're really focused on providing uh, the absolute best customer experience possible. And obviously you don't want to be dealing with a flat tire when you're on the road or what have you. Okay, and this is done in house, right? Zip mechanics are the ones that are doing this. Uh, we partner with local um, mechanics and local um, maintenance people in in every community. Uh, so we have um, there's not like a zip car warehouse per se, but we have uh, partnerships with um, you know, dozens of uh, of mechanics like across every borough um, that we work with on that kind of thing. Understood. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question from the committee? I I do, if, if you wanted to call on me. Yeah, go right ahead. Sure, so I wanted to follow up on Angelo's question. It was a, it was a good question on, on who's repairing it. And uh, it, it was said that there would be a um, repairs from local maintenance people, local uh, mechanics and whatnot. Um, is that something that would be, you know, set in stone possibly where you have a contract with a mechanic that's located and does business in community district 11 of Brooklyn, uh, or are these just contracts, uh, you know, that whoever's available, whenever available, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
It's a good question. I would um I'd have to refer with my maintenance team, the operations team, to see uh how they make those uh decisions exactly. If you you know we're always looking for um, additional partners, and we'd be happy to uh to connect with providers in uh, CD11 if uh if you guys have community connections or recommendations. But um I know that you know one of the biggest uh, labor burdens is moving the vehicles around. So generally, like if a, if a vehicle is parked in a location, we're trying to get it serviced as close as possible. We're not, you know, we're not trying to take a car from Brooklyn to the Bronx to get uh, it looked at. Like generally speaking, these cars are serviced as locally as possible. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that would be great if we could, you know, provide some contracts or some extra jobs to the, you know, the local mechanics um, and really have them you know, do it, uh, even having somebody from community board 10 or community board 12, uh, a neighborhood away, uh, could still take away some, some, uh, jobs and, and money away from local mechanics in our own district. Uh, so that was just the point I wanted to hit on. Thank you, Angelo, for, for raising that. Um, separately, uh, I had a question on if you had any data or statistics on the, the amount of car theft break-ins, et cetera, you know, you know, carjackings, whatever, when these cars are parked on the street overnight, uh, whether it's in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, Staten Island, any of the boroughs. Um, we don't have uh, public metrics on that. To the extent there's um, damage or other issues, we do liaise with DOT. It hasn't been like a huge issue uh, in the pilot program for our on-street locations, to be honest. Um, you know, there are some more like run-of-the-mill issues that you might expect uh, in terms of cars that are parked on the street. But um, it is something that we look at and, you know, we're trying to place these vehicles in areas that uh, not only the vehicles are safe, but that, you know, you as a, as a driver would feel safe in accessing them. Uh, you know, we're not trying to put a car down a dark alley or something like that. Um, but I can tell you that we're constantly evaluating uh, the risk associated with operating our fleet. And so if, uh, we are, there is like an internal mechanism for tracking that. And if we thought that we were placing the car in an area that was not safe, either for the vehicle or for the member, that we would do our best to relocate it as quickly as possible. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, definitely. I know it's not in your interest as a company to have your property being broken into or damaged. Uh, and it's not in our interest as a community uh, either. Uh, I just wanted to point out if, you know, somebody were to commit a crime, is it are they more likely to hit on these vehicles or are they more likely to hit on regular homeowner vehicles or renter vehicles, you know? Uh, that was just kind of the gist of what I was getting at. Is are yeah, these yeah. prone to to theft or robbery and crime? If it's not a trend that's been flagged for me, and um, well, as we expand, I hope that it continues along that track. Uh, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we're we're not looking to um, place these vehicles in areas that would uh, invite that sort of risk. I have one question also too that I just thought of. Robert, give me a second. Um, what about alternate side parking? Are they subject to alternate side parking regulations? No, car share cars are exempt from moving the cars for alternate side parking. Uh, as a compromise from that, car, the car share companies are responsible for cleaning their sites and the 15 feet before and after the sites. And we get monthly uh, maintenance reports from the car share companies to make sure that they're doing it. Okay, thank you. Um, Robin? Now, I was looking at the addresses that you picked here. Um, is this more of the free parking that you guys are taking, or is it at, at, at possible where you could use meters and leave the free parking to the residents of the neighborhood? Is that is that in a possibility or consideration? Because I was looking at 21, 25 Bath Avenue. Okay, that to me, is, if I remember correctly, is, is the metered parking, but on Cropsey Avenue, it isn't. It's free parking. We have an a big enough problem with parking in the neighborhood. My question here is, can we dedicate metered spots for the car share and give that to them instead of uh, Kia taking up free spots? Was that ever considered when picking your when you're picking your location? So we have a set of siting criteria for the car share companies, um, and part of that siting criteria for the moment is um, 
not in metered sites. So right now we are not citing any car share sites in metered areas. That is a conversation that we're starting to have internally to possibly look at and change, but for the time. Okay, so basically, basically in order to do the car share, you're actually taking uh, two spots at each location away from residential parking, whatever that's going to be. I know the stats say that you take off 13, uh, 13 cars for every uh, ride share. Is that, um, is that just Brooklyn or is that just an average nationwide? So Brooklyn is a, is a uh, car centric area, especially for those areas that don't have um, transportation, you know, buses or trains nearby. So I was just asking, you know, can we consider that for anything in the future that it be more metered spots that it be given up, not necessarily residential parking spots? I'm sorry that I dropped off. That is something that we're talking through. Um, nothing has been decided as of yet, but for this iteration right now, it is um, non it non metered sites. Thank you. I, I just want to throw into what Robert said. It's not really residential. These are business areas. So you're taking away from the business's income because people can't park there to use those businesses also. Um, there's a question in the chat I just wanted to ask from um, Ida. Can uh, or does Zipcar partner with large residential developments to provide off-street parking in the building's parking lots? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, we do. Okay. Um, also, um, I was wondering, we had Zipcar on 18th Avenue and 86th Street in the municipal parking lot. There was like four spots there. Is that still there? Yes. And do you have any utilization numbers on those, how it's doing there? Yes. So I don't have specific for that garage, I can get that to you. Uh, but as a whole, the mark, the municipal parking facilities, uh, zip cars in seven of them within Brooklyn, and they average 27 trips per month, serving uh, 17 different households, families, people per month. Right. No, that would be great if you could get us the data on that particular location. Yes. Because I've, I've never seen anybody actually utilizing those cars. So I'm just curious. Also, that location's on 18th and 86th. And now you're putting one on 18th and Cropsey. That's only a few blocks away. I mean, that's a really close proximity. Everything else is spread out a bit, but that's pretty a pretty close proximity. 18th and 86th to 18th and Cropsey is three blocks. Okay, we can take a look at that and possibly relocate. We'll see. Committee members, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask. I mean, Zipcar is a private company, right? Um, well, I mean, why should they be giving uh, spots to the public? I mean, why can't they do like any rental car company rent space and have people park there? I know I missed what he said. Um, well, we're partnering with DOT on this program. I would say it's not an either or. We do that as well. We partner with private garages, residential facilities, universities, you name it, to uh, place cars in private lots. Uh, this is in addition to that, um, working with DOT to try to bring uh, transportation amenity to every corner of New York as you need it. Any other questions from the committee? Um, is um, actually I got a question. Can we get the can we get a copy of the criteria that you use for anything furniture as as far as what you when you pick sites? Can we can we see can we the committee see what what your criteria you're using in order to do that? Yes, everything's on our car share website, um, nyc.gov slash car share, but I can send along everything, um, including the presentation to Leroy tomorrow so he can share with everyone from the board. Okay, and I, I just also want to throw back in there because I had mentioned about 18th and 86th already having Zipcar, and then this new site is 18th and Cropsey. Um, 
You also pick in 79th and 18th. 79th and 18th is pretty close to 86th Street. That's six blocks away. Short blocks. Like, it, it seems like you're putting, there's going to be three locations within a few block span. Do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, these sites are placed in areas where we find that we have um, unusually high unmet demand. So uh, for people who are, we're not trying to place them um, adjacent to other sites, but uh, as you know, as a New Yorker, you know, sometimes people want something that's closer to one section or another. So there was uh, some data deviation between one site versus the next. Uh, happy to take a second look at um, the stuff that you're flagging. Yeah, but, uh, you, the intention is not to overcrowd an area. Look at it on a map and you'll see what I'm saying, how close it's a straight line and they're really um, close to each other, the three locations. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to uh, go back to what I said a moment ago. I mean, there there are car rental companies. These car rental companies are obligated. I mean, I mean like any other business, right? They have their own lots. They pay for their own place. I, I, I just don't see why we should be giving Zipcar uh, exclusive rights to the area that's uh, that's given to the public. It is a private company. Uh, they can say they're providing a public good. Uh, many companies do. I don't see why we why we should be giving them uh, priorities that no other company has. Uh, so it's a program as a whole. It's on street, off street, car share parking. We have two other companies in the program. It just so happens that Zipcar was the only company that chose sites in your community board. We are trying to increase access to alternative modes. We've also found environmental successes with car share, along with freeing up some curb space because car share does allow people who perhaps don't use a car every day or who are thinking of purchasing a car to now not purchase one or perhaps sell a car that they maybe don't use every day. So we're seeing we're seeing impacts and some good effects from car share. We also will be getting monthly data from the car share company. So we will be understanding the usage, how many people and families these sites are serving. Um, and what you know, once we have some did we lose her? No, yeah, she's back. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why my computer keeps cutting out. Um, we're gonna be getting monthly data from these car from the car share companies, Zipcar. We will once we have about Please don't quote me on this. About six months, I want to say that's still in talks. Um, we will be coming back to the boards to share this data. We also this is how we're going to address um, how we move forward with car share, whether these sites stay, whether they get relocated, or whether they're removed. Um, so we will be understanding how these cars cars are used. Right, but uh, on that again, it's not like without Zipcar or whatever other company is in a different community. It doesn't matter. It's not like there are no options for people who don't own cars before. I mean, before I owned the car, I you know rented cars frequently from from companies that had their own lots and only taking spots away from the public. I just I'm just asking one last time. I, I just why it is that that they these companies can't be treated like any other car rental company where they get their own lots and don't take away spaces from the public. Uh, let me jump in and Ruben in. in the car share uh, industry is much entirely different than renter cars. Uh, you have more perks using Zipcar. I'm a Zipcar member myself. I do have a membership to Zipcar. And there's a lot of things that's included in, in using Zipcar than you don't have with the rental. For instance, you have gas that's paid by Zipcar. They have a gas card in each car that you go pull into any gas station and you can fill up the car. You don't have that with a rental. You can also rent by the hour, by the day or whatever. You don't have the same perks with a rental. I've, I've rented cars and you know, there's more problems with that than with the zip car. Thank you, Jeff. Jay is raising his hand. We no, just, I just Jay. respond to Jeff for one, for one moment. No, let's move on because Jay hasn't okay. spoken yet and let's give Jay a chance. Jay. Yeah, yeah just um, zip car is owned by Avis, correct? Correct. Avis, right? Yeah, we're owned by the Avis Budget Group. Right. Um, it, w from the city's perspective, like, is, is there oversight of of Zipcar and the charges to to residents? Because uh, there have been, obviously, this happens with a lot of large corporations. But I, you know, just a year or two ago, Avis had to pay a big settlement for overcharging 
customers as part of a federal uh, lawsuit from the Department of Justice and Zipcar. I, it, it was back a while ago. I think it was when the Attorney General was Eric Schneiderman. They had some sort of settlement for false practices in their charging. So, is there oversight from the city? You know, being that we're providing this to them and we're going to be providing them a lot of customers that they're going to be charging for their services. Uh, there's as much oversight as as we're allowed um, in terms of a city agency and the type of permit that we have with Zipcar. We, you know, as part of the rules and part of our program package, we um, mandate that Zipcar and all the participating car share companies come up with equity and outreach plans. Um, some equity discounts, um, whether it's, you know, for NYCHA residents, SNAP participants, low income families. Um, so that's, it's a fine line of what we can, what we can dictate and what we can't dictate to these companies. Um, but we try our best to make sure that there are tiers of pricing um, and that it's affordable to most New Yorkers. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, when is the implementation of these four locations? So implementation, we are looking towards perhaps end of April for signage installations. Okay, and once and once they well, once they're installed, when, once they're set up to be installed, how long before you actually go back? Was it six months or a year to check out their usage? Oh no, no, we're going to be getting monthly data from these companies. So once cars are in the spaces, we will start getting monthly data. Um, we just, before we come back to the board and share, we'd like to collect a significant amount um, of data and statistics so we understand what's going on and we can report accordingly. I'll also add that, uh, you know, if one of your concerns about usage statistics is that these cars will be there and not being used, uh, we're constantly monitoring that. And, you know, as we've worked with DOT before, if we have a site that's not being properly utilized, uh, you know, We'll talk with the OT to deactivate that site. Yeah, you know, we're a very data-driven company. We're looking to go with what works, and if something doesn't work, then you know we're going to be quick to uh, go the other way. Uh, the last thing we want is these cars sitting on uh, the streets in your neighborhood and not having people use them because that would defeat the purpose. Thank you. I have to ask you a question because, as we know, some Brooklynites really just park where they want to park. What happens if you come back after using a zip car and the spots taken? The spots are taken. People park all the time when they're not supposed to park. What does that person, what do I do? I'm driving a zip car and I get back and there's a car taking up the two spots or a truck or whatever, what happens? You as um, you as the zip car driver, you, you call our customer service line and we would most likely direct you to the nearest available uh, legal parking, whether that's a garage or other street parking. And then our, uh, our fleet, our operations team would come and, and sort out the logistics on getting the car back into the space. And we would uh, also ask that you make a 311 yeah, report uh, for block spaces. We get all those reports um, and we we confer with uh, local NYPD precincts um, and to ask that the T agents go out for extra enforcement. Okay, thank you. Well, can I? Any, any other comments from the committee? Yes, I, I had a follow-up okay. question to that. You said to make a 311 call and then you'll DOT would follow up with NYPD. Uh, I would just like to know, you know, what are the repercussions for parking in a spot that is labeled zip car only to a non-zip car driver car? Unfortunately, it's just the ticket. Okay, you say unfortunately. It, it's it just sounds the like ticket. DOT, right? Yeah, the DOT want to press more for for possibly like you know towing a car in the future. That's a that's a conversation we can have. Um, it it depends on our partnership with. PD, but that's certainly a uh, suggestion I can take back. I would, I, I just make the record clear. I wasn't suggesting that. I just wanted to see if that was already a conversation being had in DOT slash NYPD. Uh, if it is, it is. If it's not, it's not. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, I understand so, that. Yeah. During the pilot, we had the policy that um, if a site was blocked, the car share companies at their own expense could tow the cars, but the caveat that they had to tow the illegally parked car into a legal parking spot um, during the pilot, uh, Zipcar Nor Enterprise took that option, um, but that that was an option during the pilot. Okay, so that's an option during the pilot. It's no longer an option if it were to come into our community district. 
have those discussions again with Zipcar and the and the following car share companies. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee members? Okay, any other comments at all about anything transportation wise from the committee members? No, then at this point, I would like to thank Leroy and Stevie and Tori for coming out tonight and presenting to us. And thank you to our transportation um, board members for giving your time again tonight. So I'll Wait, make a motion. Sorry, a sorry. You, said, you said any other comments, anything transportation related? Well, yeah, re yeah semi-related to this, you know. Okay, can I ask about bus lanes or is that uh, too far? Oh. Uh, in terms right, of scratch what? It. Scratch it, we'll do it another time, it's okay. All right, sounds good. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second it. Yeah, everybody's in favor of that one, right? <laughs> all right, thank you all, thank have a great you, night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.